هلا والله دكتور جلينا حياك كيف الحال اخبارك جاهزه انا اي اوبن ذا روم اوكي يس جوين اند ال ميك يو كوست شكرا شكرا السلام عليكم دكتور جلينار اهلين اهلين دكتور علي يس هاو ار يو؟ وي هاف ويتنج تقريبا تقريبا اراوند 40 كانديديت اند يو كان شير يور سكرين اند يو كان اوبن ذا كام بيفور وي ستارت تمام لا زال الحجم كبير تمام الان الصوره اوضح كده تمام خلاص ايوه اوكي الكاميرا جيده تمام تنزل شوي يا ترى كده تمام ممتاز جدا يلا نفتح الروم ان شاء الله نفتح الروم ان شاء الله نفتح الروم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله I will admit all
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining our uh, education activity and our meeting on pediatric cardiac, uh, pediatric, uh, so the pediatric uh, critical care. Uh, today we have uh, fluid assessment and fluid management in pediatric cardiac ICU. We have Dr. Jelinar uh, Idris from Pediatric Cardiac Center and Prince Sultan uh, Cardiac Center in Al Hassa. Uh, uh, so the floor for you, Dr. Jelinar, and you can start. Thank you, Dr. Ali, for the introduction. Thanks, everybody, for joining me in this uh, lecture. Uh, my talk today will be about fluid assessment and fluid management in pediatric cardiac ICU. I hope you will find it nice presentation and not to get bored. So whether our patient need fluids or not will remain the most critical question in the ICU. We all know that giving fluids to a patient who need them can be a life-saving. But on the other hand, giving it unnecessarily may affect not only the patient, but all our system negatively. And this can be by increasing the length of stay, increasing the mortality, delay wound healing, generalized edema, which predisposed to infection, and etc. And a lot of studies prove that already. So why we need fluid? And how we will evaluate our fluid requirements? And what are the indicators guiding our fluid management? And how we can judge if the patient really get benefit from fluid or not? To achieve this balance, we need to have an accurate guidance and indicators to help us make this decision. And for that, we need to ask ourselves why we are giving this to us and what is our target and what we are planning to achieve. So I will start with short scenario, which we are commonly facing in the pediatric cardiac ICU. There will be a poll and I hope everybody will participate in the answer. So this is a two years old boy, 10 kg, post of repair with rastelli operation received in the cardiac surgical ICU one hour back. Currently his heart rate is 120 per minute. His blood pressure is 70 by 50. His CVP is eight and his urine output is five TML. So the question, whether you will give this fluid, yes or no? So kindly guys, you will uh, see the question in your uh, uh, like uh, mobiles or like whatever PC you are seeing. I would like uh, just uh, get uh, around like 30 seconds uh, before sharing the results to the project in our. I can just I saw the video because I want to mute. So we have 67% maybe. So we have around 67% uh, they agree to give fluid and 33% they would like to wait. So like there is like discrepancy about the decision to throw Jill up. Exactly. So let's move to the next question. So what is or what are the parameters which guide your decision? Was it the blood pressure? Was it the heart rate? Was it the CVP, urine output, or others? Uh, another poll will appear, and you can choose more than one answer, by the way. OK. So guys, you can choose multiple uh, like uh, parameter. Uh, and yeah, and we'll see the most parameter uh, probably being used uh, for assessing fluid responsiveness on whether cardiac ICU or like medical ICU in general. But on that scenario.
and adjusting it. Yeah. So around uh, 50% uh, of participant answered. So I'm gonna share the result guys with you. So basically, like most of the people will go for blood pressure, uh, CVP and urine output, uh, main parameter. Uh, I think the second, then after that, the heart rate, then there is others uh, being chosen, uh, which is around only 14% uh, from the participants. That's fair. So this discrepancy in the answers is the main concern of all of these lectures. I'm sure uh, most probably most of us, we choose the same answers based on the same data. And even in real life, if we were put in the ICU, we will make the same decision. But we will see over this presentation, despite this is common practice that we are doing it in daily basis, how complicated is this simple decision? So basically there are four main indication for giving fluid in the ICU. It would be either resuscitation in cases of shock, for maintenance if the patient is not getting any oral feeding, as a replacement or as a nutrition, or combination of all of these factors. The rationale behind giving fluid will be all the time to optimize the preload of the patient. Especially in cardiac ICU, we know that patient will have capillary leak, post bypass. Most probably it's a regular protocol to have ultra filtration inside OR. So the patient received Lasix, he received Manitol. He is basically intravascularly depleted. For that, most of us will choose to give them volume. And usually the target of our volume is to improve the cardiac output and the tissue perfusion and to improve the hemodynamics of the patient. If we are going to the cardiac output, we know that cardiac output equal the heart rate times the stroke volume. And the stroke volume depends mainly on preload, after load and contractility. The preload is affected by the CVP or is reflected by the CVP and pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and it's affected by the starting load. The afterload is the resistance of the ventricle to eject blood, and it's affected mainly by two variables, which is the vascular tone and the transmural pressure, and the contractility, which is affected mainly by perfusion, uh, coronary perfusion, I mean, and the myocardial function and the inotropic use. So if you go to preload, we know that preload is the end diastolic volume producing the passive stretch of the myocardium before each contraction. So when we are talking about fluid management, Basically, we are talking about reload. So why we need the fluids? Actually, we need the fluid to improve the right ventricle preload mainly, which is the venous return. And this venous return is usually determined by the difference between the mean systemic pressure and the right atrial pressure. The mean systemic pressure is determined by the blood volume, the vascular tone, and the flow distribution within the reservoir, whether this reservoir is the vessels or the ventricles. And the RA pressure is directly affected by change in intrathoracic pressure in relation to atmospheric pressure. So the venous return is maximized when the RA pressure is just below the atmospheric pressure. We know that spontaneous breathing decreases the right atrial pressure, so increase the gradient between the RA and the mean systemic pressure, and this will help to increase the venous return and increase the right ventricle preload, ultimately increasing the cardiac output. The opposite is happening with positive pressure ventilation. So positive pressure ventilation is decreasing the RV preload. So basically, we know that venous return become maximum with more negative pressure swing. And so we should not ignore this effect of transmural pressure and intrathoracic pressure in the cardiac output. And we know that a lot of studies prove that PEEP applied during mechanical ventilation will affect directly the venous return. 
And this is by compression of the intrathoracic inferior vena cava through the hyperinflated lens. So actually we are talking about positive pressure ventilation affection on the right ventricle preload. This can be augmented by giving fluid, but we should not ignore that positive pressure ventilation on the other hand can improve the cardiac output by affecting the left ventricle afterload and decreasing the pulmonary shunt and improving the oxygenation. So uh, ventilation can also improve the, uh, sorry, it can affect the venous return by affecting the mean systemic pressure directly because during inspiration, the diaphragmatic descent can increase the intra-abdominal pressure, which will increase the mean systemic pressure. The variation in systolic blood pressure during inspiration was used to determine preload responsiveness in many studies in a lot of literature. So in preload responsive heart, there is increase in systolic pressure followed by a fall in the blood pressure during the inspiratory phase of mechanical ventilation. This difference is usually between five to 10 millimeter mercury. And in other the magnitude of this systolic pressure variation, predict the fluid responsiveness to increase in the preload. Thus, if the pulse pressure variation was greater than 15%, then cardiac output will increase. And if it was less than 15% increment, this means the cardiac output is not dependent mainly on the preload. Another fact that in preload independent heart, such as with congestive heart failure, positive pressure inspiration will result in increase in systolic blood pressure due to decrease in the left ventricle afterload, as we said in the previous slide. If we are talking about left ventricle preload, it is mainly affected by right ventricle preload. When the RV and diastolic volume increase, the left vent and diastolic volume and compliance will decrease, leading to reduce in the IRV fillet. So if we go to the Frank Starling law, there is a misconception in the ICU that the patient will improve if he was giving fluid bolus. And even in the best center of the world, you will see this practice. Although all of us, we know that according to Frank Starling law, the stroke volume of the left ventricle will increase the left ventricle volume, causing a more forcible contraction. This is assuming that all other factors are constant. So we can divide the patient into fluid responder and fluid non-responders, but finding the cutoff point is very difficult. Secondly, giving fluid even into hypovolemic patient will improve cardiac output to a certain limit, after which it may worsen the condition, especially in pediatric cardiac patient. Because we know after bypass, usually patient is having depressed cardiac function. So by giving 50 ml normal saline, you cannot guarantee if the patient will move from point A to point B or to point C, as this will depend mainly on myocardial function and the ability of the fiber to distend and the intrathoracic pressure. So you cannot always get what you want. Also, if we keep in our mind that fluid response is depending markedly on this heart function and the ability of the muscle to distend, we will realize that at a certain point, no matter volume that you give to the patient, there will be no change in stroke volume or in cardiac output. So we should always keep in mind that number is not the crucial factor affecting our decision. So the CVP number, it's not the direct factor which affecting giving fluid or not. But we need to know how much increase in the preload or in the CVP will lead to a clinical significant effect. And will this will improve the cardiac output or not? So what are the variables guiding our assessment and how we can judge that giving fluid is beneficial? Typically, what we are teaching our uh, staff 
that we will evaluate our patient based on clinical data, based on laboratory factors. And if we look to all these factors in the next few slides, you will realize that there is no particular factor that you can make your decision based on it in isolation of other factors. So we can divide the variables guiding our fluid management into static and dynamic variables. The static variables measure a single value, for example, in pressure like the CVP or like blood pressure. And for volume, uh, we can take a global end diastolic volume as an example, which is measured by ECHO. The dynamic variables, which is the new trend in the ICU, it apply a control variation and measure the hemodynamic response to these measures. So for example, they are applying positive pressure ventilation and they will improve the, uh, observe the variation during respiration, variation in stroke volume, in pulse pressure, in systolic blood pressure, IVC diameter, and a lot of others. The same also is applied on passive leg rising which is used in adult mainly now. So as we said, variables can be heart rate, blood pressure, CVP, capillary fill time, left atrial pressure, urine output, pulse pressure variation. If we go to laboratory, we can judge our fluid and hydration state of the patient based on lactate, all of us, we will see high lactate in patient post-cardiac surgery. One of the possibilities that the patient is hypervolume. So a lot of us will go to give patient volume. Venous saturation as a guide of low cardiac output. Hematocrit also. Low hematocrit is indicating hemodilution, high hematocrit is indicating high viscosity. VON also as a guide of dehydration. Radiologically chest X-ray, if it's congested lung, this indicates that the patient is having fluid overload. If it's oligemic lung, this indicates that the patient is having low blood flow to the lungs. And echo and ultrasound, which is the new guidance nowadays for hemodynamic monitoring, as we will see later. So if, if we come to see these factors one by one, let's take a heart rate, for example. As in the scenario, which we presented in the first slides, there is more than 50% choose their answer of giving that patient fluid based on his heart rate. But post-cardiac surgery, heart rate may be high or low, depending on the type of medication, for example, the patient is receiving. So a usual combination like adrenaline and Prisidex, one of them can increase the heart rate, the other can slow the heart rate. So heart rate in this case is not a reliable indicator of the volume status of the patient. At the same time, heart rate can be a sign of pain or anxiety. And all of us, we know that patient coming from cardiac ICU for surgery, the usual to have some sort of arrhythmias or on pacing, whether it's temporary or permanent pacing. So again, the heart rate is not a good indicator in these cases for fluid management. If we come to urine output, also urine output can be a misleading. For example, in the scenario mentioned, the patient was having 50 ml urine output in the first hour post-op. But the patient is having maintained his urine output because he's post-ultra filtrate and he received directly before shifting diuretics. So the first few hours in cardiac ICU, which is the most critical time, urine output can be maintained despite the patient being hypovolumic. So it's not always a good indicator for the volume status. Then if we come to the blood pressure, we know that low blood pressure 
can be due to hypovolemia. But in cardiac ICU, again, it can be to low cardiac output syndrome post bypass. The other factor which can control the blood pressure in the ICU, we know that targeted blood pressure, as all the nurses are asking us, doctor, what is your target blood pressure? I cannot all the time give them a clear answer because whatever number I'm giving them, I cannot guarantee whether this target blood pressure is really what the patient needs. Another factor that high blood pressure can be because of inotropes, not because the patient is maintaining good intravascular volume. And all of us for sure, we are struggling with the surgeon. So blood pressure can be low simply because the surgeon asked to maintain low blood pressure because he's worried about the surgery, especially in cases like AV canals, post arterial switch operation. We know that always the surgeon will demand to maintain low blood pressure as far as perfusion of the patient is maintained. If we come to the main factor that everybody and for the last maybe 40 years or 50 years, we are relying on CVP as an indicator or as a guiding for volume status of the patient. So actually CVP is affected by many factors, not only intravascular fluid volume, but CVP can be high on RV dysfunction, for example, like the patient post of, or the patient may having high CVP because of high intrathoracic and high pleural pressure. So an elevated CVP may suggest not only fluid status, but it can suggest RV dysfunction, trichus with regurgitation, pericardial effusion in some cases, constrictive pericarditis, increase in pulmonary vascular resistance, cardiac tamponade, SVC syndrome, fluid overload. So high CVP as a target is not always a good studying a large cohort in patient with cardiac disease, undergoing right side cath. This study was done in adult in 2017. They found a significant reduction in glomerular filtration rate with high CVP, even if CVP reaching above six. Then we come to the left atrial pressure. As the CVP is monitoring the right side preload, the left atrial pressure is reflecting the LV preload and the LV function. And there is a strong relation between both of them So for example, in severe pulmonary heart hypertension or in right side heart failure, uh, the CVP will be raised while the LA pressure will be normal or low. In hypovolemia, both of them can be low. In cardiac tamponade, for example, LA pressure and CVP almost will be the same and the systolic pressure of the LV and RV will be the same. So if we continue all other static parameters, they are having this limitation. So we need to find further parameters to help us guiding our management. So people started to move to dynamic variables as a guidance for fluid response and for fluid management. And they use heart-lung interaction during mechanical ventilation to evaluate the variation either in stroke volume, for example, or in systolic blood pressure or in pulse pressure. So the first uh, which was proposed earlier was the pulse pressure variation. So in the pulse pressure variation, they estimated from arterial waveform and stroke volume variation from pulse analysis. The hemodynamic effect usually is because of the cyclic increase and decrease in the intrathoracic pressure during mechanical ventilation, which affect right and left ventricle preload and afterload. 
a change of 12 to 13 percent was being reported as highly predictive of volume responsiveness. This variation has been found to be a reliable predictor of positive response of fluid challenge, despite being a nice way of observing and evaluation fluid response, it has a certain limitation because the patient must be on positive pressure ventilation with tidal volume more than eight ml per kg. The patient should be free from arrhythmias, which is not possible in cardiac ICU. The patient should have normal RV function, which is almost impossible after bypass. And the patient should be on mechanical support like on ECMO. Uh, the second dynamic variables which we evaluated is the end expiratory occlusion test. Uh, this consists of uh, interruption of mechanical ventilation for 15 seconds to suppress the cyclic degrees of cardiac preload during insufflation of the ventilator. Uh, as ventilation is stopped during maximum peak, so the cyclic effect of the ventilation on the right side preload will be maximum. Even if this end expiratory occlusion test will stop for further period, it may be affecting also the left ventricle preload and increase in stroke volume and cardiac output in response to this maneuver was found to be a good predictor of preload responsiveness, even for both ventricles. The increment usually they are uh, putting a cutoff by 5% in cardiac output and in arterial blood pressure, uh, which will indicate a positive fluid response. The limitation for this maneuver that especially in pediatric 15 second respiratory hold cannot be sustained some time. And patient um, may not be able to hold his breath or maybe not tolerate stopping the mechanical ventilation for more than 16 seconds. Uh, the third maneuver which was uh, used and investigated thoroughly is the change in the venocaval diameter during positive pressure ventilation. This is estimated by ECHO. Uh, they found that the reference value for the IVC collapsibility index so they are measuring by echo the IVC diameter during expiration and during inspiration, the maximum diameter and the minimum diameter. And they, they found collapsibility index of 30% as a cutoff point of fluid response. In other, they are using 50%. Uh, is, uh, they found it uh, it's associated with reduced right atrial pressure and uh, in severe dehydration. And this indicates that the patient needs fluid therapy. The problem in the pediatric that still there is no clear guidelines that what is the reference numbers regarding the IBC diameter itself or regarding the collapsibility index. So most of the studies or most of the trials, they rely on the adult data. Uh, another uh, tool to evaluate our hemodynamics was the Doppler echo to assess the change in aortic flow velocity and stroke volume. This actually, they are assessing the aortic blood flow peak velocity related to respiratory cycle. It's usually measured in the aortic annulus or the left ventricle outflow tract by using pulse wave Doppler with transthoracic or transosphageal echo. It is a promising marker uh, for optimizing of preoperative fluid therapy in the pediatric population. And a lot, a lot of studies now growing, especially for this one, because we will see that almost it is the only one found, especially in pediatric population, to be a predictive of fluid response. So let us see what evidence is telling us to do because it's now more confusing. Studies mostly concentrate on fluid responsiveness, which is defined 
as the patient responds to fluid administration by a significant increase in stroke volume or in cardiac output. The cutoff usually is 15%, which is used as threshold for fluid response. Actually, physiologically, fluid response, this means that the patient is preload dependent and his cardiac output depending only on volume. But many studies prove that this physiological response exists only in half of the patient receiving fluid challenge. Evidence continue to evolve over the last few years and continue to evaluate this debatable question, whether to give fluid or not. All evidence continue to support a major idea of moving from static variables to dynamic variables. So this study was published in Critical Care Journal in 2010, evaluating the static measures of preload. The conclusion was the best use of CVP and pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, which was using swan guns. And for a long time, people abandoned this uh, practice, are in their negative predictive value. So a high CVP more than 10 is like, less likely to respond to fluid bullets. And the high pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, for example, for more than 11, is less likely to respond to fluid bullets. A retrospective analysis of a large database called the MIMIC-3 has revealed higher 28 days mortality in patients with CBP above 10 in the first 72 hours in the ICU. Also studies showed that only 40% of the patients who received fluid really needed them, and only 50% showed improvement after fluid bonus. The surviving sepsis guidelines Pre-2016 version determined CVP to be 8 to 12 in spontaneously breathing patient and 12 to 15 in ventilated patient as the target goal for the fluid bolus. So always they want to maintain the CVP in the range 8 to 12 for spontaneous breathing and 12 to 15 in the ventilated patient. But in the same year, another study was published which concluded that maintaining CVP in the range recommended by the guideline is associated with increased incidence of acute kidney injury and a mortality, especially in septic patients. And by the way, this is making a huge sense because we are increasing the CVP, targeting improved end organ perfusion. But actually, if we think about it, increasing CVP will affect our renal perfusion pressure. Because if we minus the CVP from the mean blood pressure, as you decrease the gradient, this means you are compromising the renal perfusion pressure. So the higher the CVP, the less renal perfusion pressure should be, and the less renal blood flow will go. For that, having acute kidney injury with high CVP is really making sense. This is another study was published in uh, 2013, this was a systemic review, reviewing the static variables like heart rate, systolic blood pressure, CVP, almost all the static measures that we are looking at in our fluid management. And the conclusion was all these static variables did not predict fluid responsiveness in children. Another study, they moved to the dynamic evaluation. So here they were assessing whether the pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation in contrast to CVP and global end diastolic volume are applicable in, in infants undergoing congenital heart surgery. So they found that pulse pressure variation predict fluid responses in infant undergoing congenital heart surgery, even before surgery. But as we said, this pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation has its limitation because they need strict condition. Patient should be ventilated. He should have normal rhythm, normal RV function, a normal respiratory compliance. This is, uh, was a huge systemic review. Uh, 
it was published also in 2013. They reviewed 12 studies and they included about 500 fluid bolus in 438 pediatric patients, ranging from one to 17 years old. So they included 24 variables. Imagine they included almost all the variables. Unfortunately, they found only the respiratory variation in aortic blood flow peak velocity as the only variable shown to predict fluid responsiveness in children. The only question that they could not find an answer for it was the optimal cutoff value for this uh, peak velocity to predict the fluid response. Uh, this is another study, uh, which was a meta-analysis to evaluate the uh, diagnostic accuracy of respiratory variation in our blood flow peak velocity for fluid responsiveness. And the conclusion was the same. This peak velocity is an accurate predictor of fluid response in children under mechanical ventilation. Recently published data uh, in the beginning of 2021, uh, studying the diagnostic accuracy of stroke volume variation for predicting fluid responsiveness in children undergoing cardiac surgery. Uh, again, it was the same. An elevation of stroke volume variation may represent a reliable predictor of fluid responsiveness in children undergoing cardiac surgery. Uh, then still people are trying to find a way, a reliable way to judge their fluid management. So this uh, was published in critical, uh, pediatric critical care medicine journal about ultrasound evaluation of the IBC collapsibility index in children with acute gastroenteritis treated with intravenous fluid. And they concluded that IBC collapsibility index may be a dynamic method to assess the response of intravenous fluid for children with acute gastroenteritis in pediatric even emergency department. Actually, this IVC collapsibility index has been evaluated thoroughly also as a tool uh, because it's simple, non-invasive. Uh, all the staff can be trying to do it. Uh, it is cheap, uh, it is rapid. Uh, but many critical units now uh, use it instead of central venous pressure. But always remain the question that what is the cutoff in the diameters? What is the relation of the age, the body surface area uh, in relation to the diameters? Because the difference is very tiny and it can be uh, operator dependent. So 0.05 or 0.02 may make a difference. Also, they found this IVC collapsibility index as an indicator of intravascular volume that it's not that sensitive. So mainly all the studies Describe it in the adult. This also another review, which was published in Pediatric Critical Medicine in 2021 about variability in the hemodynamic response to fluid bolus in pediatric with septic shock. So they found the hemodynamic response to fluid was variable and unpredictable they found to find a relation between mean arterial pressure and cardiac index change. And the adverse effect of fluid bull loss extend beyond fluid overload. In some cases, it was actually associated with reduced in mean arterial pressure, perfusion pressure, and the high inotropic requirements. Mean arterial pressure non-responders also had increased mortality. So it's not that simple to give the fluid to a patient who really doesn't need them. 
the response to initial fluid bone loss may be helpful to understand but it varies from patient to patient and you have to monitor each patient response individually. So what the evidence is telling us, evidence in conclusion is supporting that static variables are not a reliable indicator for fluid responsiveness. Blood pressure, urine output, heart rate were found to be unreliable index of intravascular volume status. The second fact that it's better to move to dynamic indices, but this needs strict condition, like the patient should be ventilated, for example, in some of them, patients should have no arrhythmia, normal RV function, and no support. So clinicians should move away from using static measures to assess volume status. The CVP and the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, which was used for decades, was found poor predictor for fluid response. A 2017 meta-analysis showed that the use of dynamic assessment in goal-directed therapy is associated with lower mortality risk, shorter ICU stay, shorter duration of mechanical ventilation. Studies also have shown that fluid responsiveness in the pediatric population is completely different from the adult. This difference can be explained by many physiological and anatomical characteristics of the pediatric population. For example, the characteristic and compliance of blood vessels differ according to the age. With increased age, the arterial vessels, wall thickness, and the collagen fiber quantity change, and both peripheral resistance and aortic resistance decrease with different rates. Blood vessels become more stiff with age because of the calcification. So as a consequence, both peripheral and proximal arterial wall distensibility will decrease. And with increasing age, this will affect the relation between the stroke volume variation and the parameters derived from peripheral arterial blood pressures, such as pulse pressure variation, I mean. Also, the overall respiratory compliance of children can be larger than that of adults. Therefore, the change in intrathoracic pressure is transmitted to the vascular system may be less when applying the same tidal volume per weight. The cardiac ventricular compliance is decreased in the neonatal heart after bypass and in the presence of clinical condition inducing ventricular hypertrophy. Predicting fluid responsiveness is difficult in the pediatric patient. However, several potential parameters can be useful in clinical situation. The current evidence indicates that change in the peak velocity of aorta is the most reliable parameters for predicting fluid responsiveness. However, this also had some limitation because the cutoff point is not really clear so far. So actually, it's becoming confusing even for me. So what we need, what we need is to guide our teams because we know that fluid management is complicated, but it is done on daily basis in ICU. So we have to create some protocols, which is helping us in fluid challenge. What fluid which you give, how much you will give, how fast you will give, what variables you will measure, when you will measure it, and how you will measure it, what is the cutoff determining positive or negative effects of this change. This guidance should be a rational and it should be an evidence-based. It should be practical and applicable for all patients, uh, not having some limitation or certain condition like ventilated patient, as we said, and it should fit our resources. So although they managed to have two easy, applicable, practical, maneuvers to judge their fluid management. They choose the passive leg raising, uh, which has been proposed as an auto transfusion method 
independent of mechanical ventilation. It predicts the fluid response uh, by moving the patient from semi-recumbent position to a position where the legs are lifted at 45 degrees. And the trunk will be horizontal. The transfer of the venous return toward the cardiac cavities, it mimics the same increase in cardiac preload induced by giving a fluid bolus. In general, the threshold to define fluid responses was with, pay, with this maneuver is about 10% increase in stroke volume or in cardiac output. The change in cardiac output is measured either directly with thermodilution or with echo, or by using the pulse pressure variation. Alternatively, change in this cardiac output can be even evaluated by heart lock interaction in patients who are on mechanical ventilation. So change in intrathoracic pressure are assessed during inspiration and expiration to detect change in cardiac output using the pulse pressure variation or the stroke volume variation or the, even the variation in IBC. Unlike the other dynamic tests, the passive leg raising is accurate in spontaneously breathing patients. And it can be done even if the patient is having arrhythmias. It can be done even if the patient is with low tidal volume ventilation. So it's fulfilling the criteria that we need to create to evaluate our fluid management. The other maneuver that the adult adopt is the venous excess ultrasound score. And this actually uh, really interesting uh, way of judging fluid. Uh, the venous excess ultrasound is a four-step protocol. It does not evaluating only the IVC, but also it assess the severity of congestion in the liver, gut, and kidney. Uh, they found that the presence of severe score to be a very specific for the prediction of fluid response. And even it can predict acute kidney injury following cardiac surgery. It's easy applicable. Emergency physician can easily utilize this protocol to guide their fluid management. And it's not time consuming. For example, a positive v venous excess ultrasound might suggest conservative fluid administration or lead to the administration of diuretics and vasopressor instead of giving the patient volume. This score with its straightforward approach and easy of use is one of the most promising new techniques for the non-invasive assessment of volume status. While current supporting evidence is limited, this technique holds the potential to significantly improve patient outcome. So actually it consisting of four stage, measuring IVC diameter, hepatic vein Doppler, portal vein Doppler and renal vein Doppler. And then you will just put it in a chart and accordingly you can judge your management. Unfortunately, still in pediatric, we don't have this luxury. So to wrap up my talk, I think my conclusion is inconclusive and I'm sorry if I make the fluid management more complicated than making it more easy for you. But still to make a decision, we need to know what is exactly our target. If our target is to improve stroke volume, preload and cardiac output, this needs integration of all clinical laboratory radiological data. This is the only way so far. And there is no gold standard clinical available to assess the volume status of the patient. However, the combined use of different methods may provide, in my opinion, an excellent assessment of the hemodynamic status. Fluid must be considered as a drug with serious adverse effect and in constant efficacy. They should be administered only if there is a reason, chance that cardiac output will increase in response. So far, there is no optimal hemodynamic value applicable to all patients or to same patient at all times. Still, we need to validate once. 
still fluid management and assessment remain a rich area for research. Thank you. Dr. Ajelinar, thank you so much. It's such an interesting uh, talk regarding like fluid responsiveness in pediatric uh, in general and also in cardiac ICU with the complexity of the physiology and also the cardiopulmonary interaction. And still there is no much in pediatric with agree that uh, the people moving now to dynamic uh, process as well as using that uh, uh, like a point of care ultrasound, I can say, uh, for uh, shock patients. So the floor is open, guys, for a um, question for Dr. Jelena regarding uh, fluid responsiveness in shock in general and in cardiac ICU. And I think there's many of uh, our colleagues from medical ICU, they are available also. Uh, we, uh, we see raised hand uh, and we can start uh, by Dr. Al Hassan. So uh, you can unmute yourself with that mind. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Al Hassan, pediatric intensivist in uh, Saud Al Baqin Cardiac Center. Uh, thanks for this very interesting talk. And the, uh, we know that it's the conclusion of inc inconclusive issue. This is very important to know. It's yeah. uh, it's my my comment is as you mentioned, doctor. It's case by case, and even it's variant regarding a variable regarding the case itself, time by time. But still, uh, I feel that what we teach there's just a comment. Our colleagues in Pulse courses, as I'm an instructor, the um, the definition of shock simply is the low volume in the main artery. So low volume in main artery means it's simply, just simplify because you know that not most of our colleagues are uh, physicians. So I'm trying to simplify for them the pulse, the, sorry, sorry, the shock, whole, all types of shock, the four types of shock. It is low volume in the main artery. That's very important. The, despite even sometimes high cardiac output, but still low volume in the main artery to compensate this low volume. So I feel that the a uh, more conclusive uh, uh, tool of uh, measurement of this response is the aortic flow velocity, which is also it's the, and guiding the, which going to the aorta, which is the most important uh, measurement regarding the aorta. But otherwise the previous or the pre-aorta, all of these pre-aorta are affected by many, uh, many causes. Venus, so Venus uh, uh, measurement, all the Venus measurements are, uh, strongly positive, but not negative. What I mean, if there is low uh, venous pressure, like collapsibility of uh, IVC, yes, it means that the, the, the baby might need volume, but, but a, a distended uh, uh, IVC or veins does not mean this. What, what do I, this is what I mean. Um, I feel, as you mentioned, it's non not everything is inconclusive or non-conclusive, but my comment, this is what I mean, sorry for that. All the tools are non-conclusive, except that this is what uh, the, the aortic uh, flow velocity. Thank you so much. So also we so, have, yep. Uh, Thanks, doctor, for your comment. And actually, all the studies, yes, prove what you are saying, uh, that the only predictable found so far as a good guidance for fluid response in pediatric is the peak velocity on the award. But still, the cutoff is not clear. It's still a new studies, and it needs more volume. We know it's difficult to be applied in pediatrics. Uh, so still, we cannot ask the pe people to liberally give fluids. Even if you said in septic shock, no, the arterial side is hypovolemic. Actually, arterial side, left side preload is affected directly by right side preload. And nowadays, there is a recent uh, septic shock uh, management guidelines, which use the fluid management protocol they distribute the fluid management into four stages. Risk, uh, they are using the word rose as far as I remember. 
So it's rescue stage. Um, I'm not sure about the second letter. And then the maintenance stage, then stabilization, then de-escalation of your management. So you have, as you said, to use the clinical data available for you, dynamic variables as much as you can to judge your fluid management. And for sure, it's patient to patient variable. Agree. And regarding the protocolized the fluid management on like recitation courses, what do you think about this, Dr. Jelenar? So I think, Dr. yeah. I did not hear you, Dr. Ali Malish. I think Dr. Hassan, he put a point where it's like protocolizing the fluid management during the recitation. I think uh, whether is that uh, uh, all the time right or not. And I feel still there is a process, as you mentioned, uh, about like uh, still uh, like there is update about fluid resuscitation on like different type of shock. Exactly. So actually the guidelines still running on that. And this is the main thing. We need to find the guidelines, but it should be practical and applicable for all type of patients. So you cannot uh, create a guideline for only specific type of patient. So they use septic shock, which is uh, mainly a base dilator shock as a guidance for fluid management, but the case may be completely different in vasovagal shock, for example. That's 100% true. Yeah, uh, I think we have Rashida. Dr. Rashida, you can unmute yourself and you can raise your question. If not, also other question. So I would like to ask people whether anybody from our audience is having a guidelines for the management, fluid management in cardiac ICU and what are the indicators that they are using guiding their fluid management? Because me, I'm self and still I'm in a dilemma. Yes. I can say, uh, Dr. Jelenaro, it will be different school, different approach. And I think it is parameter related. Um, and I agree sometimes with the surgeon about to not like overload the patient on the beginning because of the edema per se. And sometimes we can accept permissive hypotension situation uh, with those cases to allow better recovery in general. Uh, but I, I could not say it is like uh, easy on cardiac ICU, uh, but I think uh, the people now to start to be conservative rather than to be liberal on, on fluid resuscitation uh, at this stage, which is like on somehow uh, there is other like uh, parameters controlling the fluid responsiveness or like, uh, as you mentioned, cardiac ICU, there is different uh, parameter looking for the perfusion, uh, kidney perfusion, if we think about there is kidney perfusion, so that blood pressure is enough to perfuse the body. Uh, but it is definitely hard, especially the compliance of the heart is not normal, like after cardiac surgery. So mm -hmm. it is not like the regular heart, heart will, uh, will be tolerating. So it is definitely uh, uh, difficult, but I feel like uh, people tend toward the uh, uh, like the dynamic, as you mentioned, assessing the left side, using the cardiopulmonary interaction to to uh, to judge. And I agree, like CVB have a many compounder uh, affecting the CVB. It is a surrogate for something on the right side. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, uh, like pulse pressure variation, and I see now there is a different modality of monitor, a new monit monitor, which is I feel it is affected by like adult. They use it much often. Uh, it, uh, they are already auto calculating the pulse pressure variation, stroke uh, volume variation, uh, which is uh, thinking about we could use it, but without any exact number. We can uh, we can use it in pediatric, but without exact number. Uh, I think Dr. Hassan, he would like also to uh, have a question. Dr. Hassan, you can unmute yourself and uh, you can answer. Uh, sorry, doctor, this is what I needed just to. Uh to just comment on this is very important to know that uh, we need to deal 
uh, this is what I do usually to deal with the patients coming from OR, uh, especially after bypass as cardiogenic shock patients. So in cardiogenic shock patients, you need to deal very strictly with IV fluid. So this is what I mean. 50% uh, of IV fluid is, uh, I think is enough to start with and then to manage the patient accordingly. And the priority is for the inotropic support other than the fluid uh, to be liberal with fluids because it's not that easy to come out or to get out of this uh, fluid, which is very toxic to the organs, making edema of uh, such like organs, such as the, as the kidney, the liver and others, even the brain, you know. Some of our patients are, uh, we feel that our baby, babies are not fully conscious. This is because of brain edema. So um, it's better not, not to manage the, the, the patient as volume um, uh, depletion, uh, post-operative, especially post-operative. So the most important issue for us is to manage our patients as cardiogenic shock patients. And then accordingly, we can uh, build on other than to give volume and volume and volume. So the priority is restrict volume. This is my what I do. And I feel that I succeed in this. Uh, give less volume as 50%. And then even if I need to give something, I, I try to give 10% albumin, which is less volume uh, for some uh, hypotensive patients. And the priority is for anatomic support. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, your patience. Thank you. Um, okay, Dr. Hassan, thank you for your comment. Uh, but uh, what you said is, uh, I completely agree with it. Uh, this is the regular protocol in all cardiac ICU. First day, patient will receive 50% of his requirement you will increase it by 10 or 20% over the coming 48 to 72 hours till reaching full maintenance. And people tend to be conservative in fluid giving because we know that patient cardiac function are abnormal. But if you look to the presentation, I give the scenario of a patient who's tough because I know all the people or most of the people in this group uh, will agree that tough patient is having problem in the right side. So they are volume dependent. For that, more than 50% of the people choose to give this patient fluid, almost 70%, if I'm not wrong. So 70% of the audience choose to give this patient fluid bolluses, and they depend on static variables, which was like the CVP, which was eight. But it cannot really reflect what the patient needs. They depend on the blood pressure, which is 70 by 50. Uh, maybe they feel that this patient is hypotensive. For that, they choose to be below it. But they did not keep in mind by increasing the CVP. And by increasing the blood pressure, you are compromising other organs. You are compromising the renal perfusion pressure. Maybe the patient and organ perfusion is heavy with this blood pressure. You don't need to increase any number. You have to treat the patient. So I hope I make it clear. Yes. Uh, beside that, uh, Dr. Uh, Jelinar, like nowadays the people talking about balance type of fluid rather than like normal saline or like the other type of saline, which is seem to be not normal saline as we, uh, we use because of the chloride effect. Um, so that also have impact on the kidney also, which is I think most of the cardiac cases, post cardiac ICU, they have already in an impairment post the cardiac mm -hmm. bypass uh, management. If I would like to ask on the other hand, apart from cardiac ICU, if we general ICU, would you like to use the dynamic parameter more often than cardiac ICU? What do you For think? Sure. For sure, I think all the studies support moving to dynamic parameters, even in general ICU. Most of these studies in adult or in pediatric was done in general ICUs. Only few studies or a few literature is there about cardiac ICU patient. But uh, I choose to incorporate both because I'm working in cardiac ICU and I think it's more complicated regarding cardiac ICU. But uh, for sure, dynamic uh, variables should be applicable in the pediatric cardiac ICU. Yes, yeah, I feel like will be much uh, useful uh, than the cardiac ICU. I can say will be much more uh, like applicable and been uh, assessed very well. Uh, the other thing I would like to ask whether during shock situation, uh, like need of the arterial line monitoring to men to assist the blood pressure. Also, I feel uh, what do you think as a variable, especially now the people using that 
as a dynamic tool to assess like the stroke volume variation or spousal pressure variation. You would like to use it in case patients who require anotropic support on shock? Actually, you have other tools. Yeah. As we said, yani blood pressure, uh, you cannot just uh, use invasive monitoring. Yep. Static variable like blood pressure as a guidance for your management. Yeah. So you have to look to all the other clinical data. How is the patient general perfusion? How is his capillary fill? How is his heart rate? How is his pulse volume? All of it, you can look to it uh, without using invasive monitoring. True. So I don't think it's uh, really crucial, uh, but I know all the intensivists, uh, whenever they are receiving patient in shock, the first thing we'll have to put a lot of invasive line. We have to secure central line. We have to secure a carrier line for the patient. Yes. So we would like to use the all of overall the parameter can tell about uh, like the yes. integration of that. all parameters. As I conclude my talk, yes. integration of all these parameters is the only way that we are having for our clinical assessment so far. Yes, I think with the two parameters we've been discussed and recently about the published data regarding using the ultrasound actually it will have really major tool like a you know like emergency adult DB more going with the point of care ultrasound to to judge about the like uh, like uh, management of the shock in general as well as fluid responsiveness uh, i feel it is definitely needed and we'll probably if we think about and focusing in the future uh, about like our trainee uh, to uh, to focus on ultrasound it will be a very useful tool on uh, yes. totally agree i think all the new generation should focus on this part uh, it will be a major skill and it will be a mandatory skill actually in the next future i think uh, zoom user he is raising your hand or she is raising your hand, uh, raising the hand. Uh, you can unmute yourself and introduce yourself if possible. Yeah. So he's, okay. So basically we can uh, conclude here. Thank you so much to Kura Jelinar uh, about that interesting talk uh, about uh, uh, fluid responsiveness, uh, which is, I feel it is still, uh, the data on the pediatrics still need uh, like uh, further studies to, uh, to confirm the best tools, but I agree using different parameter, going from the static toward the dynamic will be very useful uh, uh, tools. And uh, the, uh, I will just leave the conclusion uh, to you, Dr. Jelinar, regarding uh, fluid uh, responsiveness on pediatric. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. As I said, my conclusion, unfortunately, it is inconclusive. Uh, I'm afraid uh, maybe I could not help all the audience much in guiding their fluid management, but uh, I, least, I hope that I managed to show them what's going on around all the updated uh, studies and uh, still this uh, issue is a debatable question and it seems it will be a debatable question for a long time. That's no doubt, yes. Thank you so much and thank you everybody for attending our uh, meeting uh, of Pediatric Cardiac ICU and we'll uh, see you inshallah in the next, uh, next few days uh, uh, with further uh, presentation. Thank you, Dr. Jelinar, for excellent mm -hmm. preparation and physiology talk. And uh, thank you, everybody, and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you all.